So now's the point in the semester when we have to take a big old step back. Because we just got done with six or seven days worth of review of abstract group theory, stuff that you may have covered in some level in abstract algebra one. But it's time to really take a big step back and think about what this semester course is all about. As promised, this is a course that's really about solving equations. So in that sense, it's about the kind of algebra that should look awfully familiar to you. But before we go any further into the abstract ideas of our second semester of abstract algebra, I think it pays to spend some time thinking about what exactly is the process that we're trying to abstract, and how does it relate to the ideas of abstract algebra that we already know. So we're going to take today, in the next series of videos, and think about what is the process of solving equations that we're interested in finding an abstraction for this semester, and how do we think that group theory is going to help us to make that abstraction. We're going to do that, actually, by looking just very briefly at the kind of ideas that powered the subject for the person who discovered it, well, not all, but the person who discovered the formulation that we're going to look at. And that person is the mathematician Everest Galois. Now, Galois' life was very interesting, both mathematically and historically, um, because he lived only for a brief period of time. He died at 20 years old. And it was very, during a very historically interesting time uh, in the world, and especially in his native country of France. Uh, so we're going to look a little bit at what were the ideas that powered Galois' study of the field, um, and then how are we going to take what's a more modern understanding of abstract algebra and kind of put a polish on what Galois' ideas were to give us something very powerful this semester. So let's get started. So in this video, a couple of videos, we're going to be kind of taking a peek into the mind of, of young Everest Galois. And Galois himself is a very interesting character. Uh, so he lived again only for 20 years, uh, from 1811 to 1832. And uh, France at that time was a very sort of tumultuous place. I mean, we're only 20, 30 years past the French Revolution, and still things are pretty unsettled. Uh, the sentiments of the public toward the monarchy are, are not exactly, well, it's not warm and fuzzy, let's put it that way. Uh, popular rebellions. This is actually, if you want a good visual, this is exactly the setting, pretty much, of uh, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Uh, so it's not exactly a time of peace and harmony and happiness in France, and it turns out that Galois kind of got wrapped up in a lot of those national politics himself. So that's the backdrop uh, behind which Galois is doing a lot of very interesting mathematics um, that it turns out you know, 50, 100, 150 years later um, that we're still really appreciating the depth and the... Uh, the wisdom of what it was that Galois did and how he did it. Although a lot of the modern tools that we use to study Galois theory um, is not something that was available to Galois at the time. For instance, Galois himself didn't even have the definition, the abstract definition of a group that we have at our disposal. So that somehow makes it even more remarkable that he was able to discover what he did without having the sort of rigorous abstract framework that we've developed since the time of Galois. So what is it all about? What is this process that we're abstracting this semester? What we want to do is think about solving equations, which is really bread and butter high school algebra, right? And the particular kinds of equations we want to study are not those that involve transcendental functions like logarithms or e to the x or trigonometry or any of that stuff. We want to be really basic. We want to do just equations that are built out of the fundamental operations of arithmetic that we can do with integers or with rational numbers or with real numbers. And those kinds of equations are built out of polynomial expressions. So a polynomial over the real numbers is exactly what you think it is, right? It's a finite linear combination of powers of a variable t. In other words, it's just the sum of a bunch of powers of t with some uh, real number coefficients out in front of them. And here t is a formal variable. In other words, it could represent a real number. It could also represent a rational number. It could represent a complex number. It could represent you know, some number that we've never heard of before. So imp the important thing about t is that it is not a concrete number. It's just a variable. right? And we call it a polynomial over the real numbers if all of those coefficients are real. And if that highest order coefficient that's listed here, the, the t to the n coefficient, if that's non-zero, and that's the highest power, the highest non-zero coefficient uh, in this linear combination, then we say that the degree of this polynomial is n. So of course, this gives us some flexibility. We're not just going to study polynomials over the reals. We're also going to look at what are polynomials over the rationals, what are polynomials over the integers, polynomials over the complex numbers. Because it turns out that the number system 
out of which we build our polynomial is an important, uh, important thing to know about that polynomial. Um, and how that number system that we build a polynomial out of relates to the solutions of that polynomial equation uh, is the, really the motivating question uh, behind our study this semester. Also, we're going to take the set of all polynomials that have real coefficients and denote it by this notation, which we'll read as r adjoin t. So this set, the set of all polynomials with real coefficients, also has an algebraic structure of its own. It's going to have the structure of what we call a ring this semester. And so one of the first things we do when we start to get back into more of the sort of abstract definitions of, of abstract algebra, uh, we're going to take a, a couple of classes and think about what are rings, and particularly in the case of polynomials, what do polynomial rings look like? But just for now, we're just going to think of it as a set of all polynomials that have real coefficients. But those polynomials are just expressions, right? We don't have an equal sign here, and so there's nothing to solve for. So we actually want to take the next step and think about equations, not just expressions. So we need to drag an equal sign in here. And the canonical way to do that is just to take an equal sign and put a 0 on the other side. And when we take a polynomial and we set it equal to 0, we're going to call a number a root of that polynomial if when we substitute that number into the polynomial, the, it satisfies that equation, p of x equals 0. Okay. Note that the historical use of the word root here. Uh, typically, when we use the word root in mathematics, what comes to mind is an nth root, like a square root or a cube root or something like that. But in general, when you use the word root by itself, it just means the solution of some polynomial equation that makes it equal to 0. And so that need not be the same as a simple nth root. In fact, that's kind of the interesting question of the semester. That's the fun part, uh, is that not every polynomial has a solution which can be built out of these nth roots. That's really the main theorem that we're trying to get at uh, this semester. So that's really what makes it interesting. So when we use the word root, don't be fooled that that always means a simple radical uh, in the way that we usually uh, use the terminology. So just as an example, the polynomial t squared minus t plus 2, its coefficients are uh, 1, negative 1, and 2. Those are real numbers, and so this is the polynomial over the reals. So it's an element of r adjoined t. Of course, these numbers are also rational numbers, so we could also think of this as belonging to the rational numbers adjoined t. These numbers also happen to be integers, so we could think of it as a, an element of the integers adjoined t. Um, because the integers are a subset of the rationals, which are a subset of the reals, uh, we can get away with, with any one of those viewpoints. What are the roots of this polynomial? Well, we can find those using standard high school algebra. Those roots are negative 1 and 2. Why? Because when I substitute negative 1 for t, or I substitute 2 for t, both of those results give me 0 out of that polynomial expression. So there's an example of a polynomial over the integers, and it's two roots. And then here's the big question. What kinds of numbers are the roots of polynomials going to be? Because the kind of numbers that you build your polynomial out of are not always the same kinds of numbers as will solve that polynomial. For instance, if I build a polynomial with integer coefficients, the roots of that polynomial don't have to be integers. Even a polynomial as simple as 4t plus 5, its root uh, may not be, in fact it is not, uh, an element of the integers itself. Because the root of this polynomial is negative 5 fourths, not an integer, but instead a rational number. Why? Because in general, in order to find the roots of a linear equation, we need to be able to divide. And in the integers, we can't divide an integer by another integer and expect to get an integer out. So in order to solve first order equations with integer coefficients, we need to be able to divide. And so we need the rationals. We, don't, uh, we can't get away with just the integers. Likewise, um, if I take something that's a little bit more than a linear equation, like t squared minus 5, just being able to divide in that second equation is not enough. Right? So we need a division to be able to solve linear equations over the integers, but we're going to need something else to be able to solve this quadratic equation over the integers. Namely, we need to be able to take the square root of 5. And the square root of 5 is not a rational number. Instead, it's a real number, of course, uh, an irrational real number. And so in order to solve these quadratic equations over the integers, we need to be able to extract square roots. Now notice that. The real numbers might actually be too much. They might be more than we need if all we need is to be able to take square roots. That one of the interesting questions of the semester is, do we need to go all the way up from the rationals to the reals in order to solve equations? In the rationals, generally, we can't take the nth root of a rational number and expect it to be irrational. But in the reals, we can take the nth root of any at least non-negative real number, and we know we'll get a real number. So 
if we don't need all of the nth roots, if maybe we just need the square roots, is there some intermediate stage that we could go to? Some number system that has my square roots but may not have my cube roots or my fourth roots. So that's going to be one of the interesting things we'd look at. But then the real numbers are, of course, not enough in general either. Because right? we have polynomials like t squared plus 16 that even if I'm able to divide and go to the uh, rational numbers, and even if I'm able to take square roots or even nth roots in general and go to the real numbers, I may not have enough to solve for the roots of this polynomial because their roots are plus and minus the square root of negative 16. And the square root of negative 16 is not even a real number. It's, in fact, a complex number. So we need more than just the square roots. We also need square roots of negative reals uh, in order to solve this equation over the integers. So the point is, even if the coefficients of your polynomial are really nice, they're just integers, that it may take a whole lot more than just the integers to find the roots of that polynomial.